Franklin Roosevelt dies. And World War II in the European theater is won. And this new president of the United States, who you saw here, if you looked closely, sitting in the front row as a fairly obscure senator from Missouri, inherits a to-do list with some very huge decisions on it. The Manhattan Project, obviously, is one that he gets briefed on. What to do with Hitler is another, because he's about to be defeated and captured and his henchmen around him. And this question of using military methods, executive disposition, executive action, dispatch, is one alternative. Or, ironically, in the War Department, lawyers are arguing we should have a trial. We, the allies who have won this war, should bring law back to the wreckage of Europe. And Harry Truman reaches to the Supreme Court, today it would never happen, and asks the best lawyer he knows, really I think what America regarded as the best lawyer we had, to leave the court to take this assignment. And Jackson, who was already done writing his opinions for the term, even though the court hadn't recessed, says yes. When your president asks, I think that is always the right answer. And he takes an assignment which he's told can be done over the summer of 1945. We're about to win. We're about to capture these guys. The evidence is all assembled. We have cases ready to go. We just need a lead counsel to be the person of appropriate stature to do this process. Jackson says, well, okay. And then in very short order, he realizes this is a total bill of goods. Hitler, of course, leaves the scene, and so do some of the other senior henchmen. There's no allied agreement about how to proceed. There's no gathered evidence. There's no assembled cases. What he's got is a diplomatic mess. And so he goes to Europe, begins to work closely with Eisenhower in May of 1945, and they become close friends. And then after this survey trip, comes back and writes a report to Harry Truman. I want to read you to, to give you some concepts that are Jackson and to give you a little bit of prose that's Jackson. Just a few sentences from this report of early June 1945. Having figured out what a hot potato this assignment is and what chaos the defeated European theater is, Jackson comes back and tells Truman that there are three options about what to do with the captured Germans. What shall we do with them? We could, of course, set them at large without a hearing but it has cost unmeasured thousands of American lives to beat and bind these men. To free them without a trial would mock the dead and make cynics of the living. On the other hand, we could execute or otherwise punish them without a hearing, but undiscriminating executions or punishments without definite findings of guilt fairly arrived at would violate pledges repeatedly given and would not set easily on the American conscience or be remembered by our children with pride. The only other course is to determine the innocence or guilt of the accused with a hearing as dispassionate as the times and horrors we deal with will permit, and upon a record that will leave our reasons and motives clear. And thus he misses a full year in the life of the Supreme Court. He goes back, receiving this letter, which I have to share with you because of the opening line, Dear Robert, Erie is quietly rejoicing, and so forth. This is his cousin who lived here, a music teacher, May Eldred McKay, uh, one of the thousands of Americans who are writing him these letters. Not all of them were as enthusiastic. Jackson goes to London and spends the summer of 1945 negotiating with his allied counterparts. And what they work out is the creation of the first international criminal court in the history of the world. This is the signing of the agreement, the British principle and the French principle on either side of Jackson. And this international tribunal has jurisdiction to prosecute four crimes which are being codified in a charter for the first time. The first is planning, conspiracy, common agreement. The second is waging aggressive war, starting it militarily. The third is committing war crimes, battlefield, soldier on soldier crimes. And the fourth, entirely novel, is crimes against humanity, occupier or attacker on civilian crimes. And then they go to Germany, or what had been Germany, because to be precise, Germany had unconditionally surrendered. There was no Germany. This was the United States military sector of occupation of the former Germany. And they landed in this city of Nuremberg, which had been bombed to smithereens 
primarily by the British, a little bit by the Americans. Uh, industrial targets uh, and somewhat indiscriminate bombing, to, I think it's fair to say, in 44 and 45. These are rubble scenes that may be familiar. So you might ask, how can you do a trial in this degree? Well, the courthouse, the attraction of Nuremberg, was that it was a little bit down the road from the center city. And although it had been damaged, you can see a little bit in this picture, uh, a missing portion of the building here. It was an intact, sizable courthouse with an adjacent prison. And it was in the American sector, and so it could be conducted there. That was the primary reason they picked Nuremberg. But it had additional reasons that certainly added to the power of this choice. Nuremberg had been the site of the Nazi party rallies beginning in 1933, these festivals of hate and Hitler enthusiasm. Uh, and you've seen Lenny Riefenstahl film uh, that captures what Nuremberg rallies were. And beginning in 1935, the Nuremberg laws were promulgated at those rallies, which were perversions of what we mean by law, but were dictatorial pronouncements that dispossessed the enemies of the state, of citizenship, of property, of residency, and in some cases of life. The trial begins in November of 1945 in this courtroom. There are 24 individuals who are charged. By the time the trial starts, there are actually 20 in the box. The lead defendant, the senior real inner circle survivors, Hermann Goering, Rudolf Hess, Joachim von Ribbentrop, General Keitel, etc., etc. And the trial goes forward for almost a full calendar year. This is November. The verdicts at Nuremberg in this international trial come down on September 30 and October 1, 1946. Each of these men was given an attorney of choice from a roster of surviving senior German attorneys who'd been identified by the Allies. Each of those attorneys was paid by the Allies. Each of those attorneys was housed by the Allies. Each of those attorneys was given discovery resources by the Allies. And each of these defendants participated responsibly in the criminal proceeding. In some sense, it takes two to play the game, and it's an odd measure of respect that the Germans, with the lawyers, seeing the Allies, subjecting them to this process of accountability, weren't disruptive, weren't uh, excluded from the courtroom, but instead were defendants who were tried. Robert Jackson opens this trial with a statement that is one of the most properly famous and lauded speeches in courtroom history. Um, you can hear much of it on the internet and see portions of it. A little bit was filmed on YouTube. That's November 21, 1945. And the trial that they give these men is based on captured documents, not witnesses who cooperated and cut deals, I'll give you my boss if you spare me kind of stuff, which leads to credibility and motive issues. No, captured Nazi documents. Is this your signature on this document? And here's what it shows. Jackson comes back at the end of that year, having built a record and accomplished verdicts, largely convictions, that stands up remarkably well as not only novel, but fair, exactly as he said we should do in his report to Truman. He's awarded the Medal for Honor, uh, which is a civilian honor. It's the equivalent of the highest military soldier decoration by Robert Patterson, who's the Secretary of War.